Welcome to PPO Expert. My name is Tom and I'll be presenting the communications course. This course is designed to give you an in-depth understanding on the theory required to pass the CAA theory exam for this particular topic. Despite this, only self-study, commitment and discipline will be required. The course is displayed in the form of a slideshow which I'll be talking through. Please feel free to pause the recording at any point to either take a break or write down any notes. So at first, when people start their PPL training, they're very uncomfortable with using the radios. They're uncomfortable broadcasting to dozens of other people, but usually it's just a confidence thing. So over time, uh, you'll become more confident using the radio and learning what to say. But it, there's still a useful uh, number of things to remember, especially as a student pilot, to help you with this. So firstly, we want to think before we speak. So think about what we're going to say before we transmit on a particular frequency. Before we transmit, we want to listen, make sure no one else is talking on that frequency so we don't step on them. Speak in a tone and at a normal conversational speed, so not too fast, not too slow, but also not too loud or quiet, so just at a normal conversational uh, volume. We want to make sure that the push to talk button is fully depressed and this is the button in the aircraft which is normally located on the control column which once we press it it's going to start um, transmitting on that frequency so we need to push it in order for our microphone to pick it up and send it out on our radio and obviously avoid hesitations so not so no ums and ahs we want to think about what we're going to say and it can come out in a nice uh, clear and not to, you know, don't want to have any ums and ahs which might hold up the frequency for other people. So first of all we're going to look at the different radio equipment that we have inside the aircraft, so the actual physical equipment uh, which makes up the communication. So we have a Radio 1, so VHF Communication 1 box, we have a nav one, so that's used, used for radio navigation. So we can tune in different radio nav aids on the ground. It's not used for talking to anyone on the ground, but it still makes up our radio equipment. We have a VHF communication two, so this is our second radio. So we have two separate communication radios in most aircraft. And again, that means that we can talk to somebody else or two different people at the same time if need be. And then we got that navigation two frequencies box, which we could use two simultaneous radio navigation devices at the same time. We have a DME which is a distance measuring equipment which means that we can use uh, find out our distances from a particular point. An ADF which is an automatic direction finder again it's we can tune it into a beacon on the ground and it will be displayed in our aircraft uh, as and where that beacon is. And lastly a transponder uh, which is a code which air traffic control can see and once they see it uh, they can see our, our location on the radar once we've input a four digit code which they've given us so it's no not as much use to us but it's useful to controllers on the ground to turn all of this on and off there is uh, on and off switches which are in those red boxes however um, what we could do or what a lot of aircraft are fitted with is a avionics master switch so this is a power source button for all of these separate devices which means that we don't need to turn them all and off uh, in one go although we just need to be careful because our radio navigation aids are sens sensitive to electric shock so we need to make sure that we start the aircraft with the avionics master switch off once the aircraft started and it's running nicely then we can turn on the radios and this prevents the um, radios from having an electric shock as the engine starts. What this will also do, it means that the volumes will already be set. Okay, so it will be usually the volume button, which is the power button for each unit. So to turn it off, we need to turn the volume all the way down and then to the off button. So the avionics master switch will mean that that is already set for us. So now we're going to look at the communication box in a little bit more detail and the different elements of it. So first of all we have a standby frequency. So in the 
in each communication or radio, radio box we have an active frequency and a standby frequency. So this is the frequency that we'll use next and it's not the one that we're currently transmitting on. It's also the one that we change as well. So we can't change our active frequency, we can only change our standby and then we can switch over between one or the other. We have a frequency selector. So as I said before, this changes our standby frequency um, in the right hand box. Okay, so we can change the different numbers and tune a frequency for a specific station. That left hand box is our frequency in use. So this is the one that we're currently using and transmitting on. And lastly, we have a flip flop switch. So that's what changes our standby to our active. So we select our frequency in the standby box. And then when we're ready to use it, we can push this flip-flop switch, which will move it into the active and move the active frequency into the standby. So there's different frequencies associated with radios, but generally for aviation, we use VHF, known as very high frequency. And this compromises of 2,280 channels, ranging from the frequency of 11 8.000 all the way up to 136.975 and here you got uh, you can see the spacings between each individual cha channel is 0.005 okay so from 118.000 it goes up 0.5 each time and then you can see the top end of the scale and you see it's five different and everything in between and it, each of those are an individual station which may be associated with a particular aerodrome or something like that. So different radios uh, have different spacings between each individual frequency and it used to be 25 kilohertz between each individ individual frequency However, throughout 2018, airfields and services uh, changed to the 833 spacing. So effectively, it made uh, three times as more channels to be able to transmit and receive on. Uh, so it increased capacity. And um, with that, there was a change in radios as well. So the radios before only had the 25 gigahertz spacing. So the physical unit inside the aircraft had to be updated in order to accommodate the new 833 spacing. So we briefly talked about the push to talk button and that's the button that engages the microphone and transmits on the frequency selected. So you can see on the control column on the right hand side on top of the yoke on the left hand side there's a small button which we can press down and I'll highlight that now and as we push that it's going to transmit on the frequency on that lower picture there's a button it's a microphone so instead of having a headset we can use a microphone again which is our push to talk so we only want to depress this when we're ready to talk and then we relay our full message whilst depressing it and once we've finished uh, transmitting then we can release this and it will make sure that we're not therefore transmitting on the radio now it's, we have to be careful because only one person can transmit on the frequency at one time. Okay, so we need to make sure it's clear, available, and no one else is talking, otherwise our message will be covered up. So we've looked at the communication box, and now we're going to look at some of the other boxes in a little bit more detail. So we've got the VHF navigation box and we can select a ground navigation station such as a VOR or possibly an ILS and that's, we can use that to pinpoint the aircraft's position. So this is radio navigation, it's covered in more detail in the general navigation section of PPL experts. We have the DME, distance measuring equipment which works in conjunction with a VOR and it can measure slant range from that uh, specific station that we're tuned into. Again, in more detail in PPL Expert, uh, so is this last one, the ADF, which is the Automatic Direction Finder, which we can tune to a beacon on the ground called an NDB, a non-directional beacon. And then we'll have a needle inside the aircraft which will point to where that beacon is and again can be used for a position fix, so finding our position on a map or for navigation.
So now we're going to look at different types of equipment at an aerodrome and specifically radar. So the first one is the primary surveillance radar and this is that larger dish which we can see on the pitch to the left and the way that works is it sends out periodic revolving beam which will bounce off an aircraft or an object and uh, and that information will be delivered back to an air control unit. So it will give a target contact and it can give a rough estimation on distance as well, depending on how long that beam takes to come back. So that's the primary surveillance radar. Then we have a secondary surveillance radar, which interrogates a transponder. Now a transponder is a unit within the aircraft which can emit a four digit code and then that can be see, seen by a air traffic controller and it can also denote a position as well. So it's more useful to an air traffic controller than the primary radar but they both have a similar use but with differences. The primary radar has a lot, it requires a lot more energy as it sends out electrical signals whereas the secondary surveillance radar doesn't need as much. So we spoke about the transponder and this is what they look like. It's a box with inside the aircraft that, uh, depending on its particular mode, sends uh, the simplest form, sends out a four digit code, which can be seen on an over overlay of a map for an air traffic controller. And then as they get different modes, they can have uh, different functions. So it's these four diff three different types of transponders is worth knowing their functions. So the mode A transponder, its only capability is of transmitting a four digit code. Okay, that's the only function it has. If we get a mode Charlie transponder, which is more common in training aircraft, it can emit a four digit code and also show an aircraft's altitude as well. So an air traffic controller can see the position of an aircraft, its code, its squawking. Now squawk is the act of uh, emitting a four digit code and also denote the altitude that that aircraft's at. And lastly, we have the mode Sierra. The mode Sierra does the two functions previously mentioned, so the altitude and the four digit code, as well as more information as well. So it can give some unique codes of information, such as call signs, the flight number, what altitude we've pre-selected in the aircraft, what fuel we have remaining, our speed, uh, our destination, so it's, it's an interrogation by the controller and they can see a lot more information and that's useful to them for their situational awareness. Now an air traffic control unit uh, may give us a squawk code which is got complete random and it's up to their discretion. However, there are some squawk codes that we should be aware of. Uh, for more uniform types of operations or emergencies. So we'll go through the different uh, ones that we should be aware of uh, are known as some standard score codes. So the first one is 7700 and we put this in our transponder in the event of we're, we're having an emergency. In the event of a radio failure we would score 7600 so maybe we can't contact someone and our radio is broken. In the event of unlawful interference, we squawk 7500. Conspicuity code, so for normal operations outside controlled airspace, we would squawk 7000, so 7000. When entering the UK airspace without uh, any particular code, so if maybe we're traveling from abroad or flying IFR conspicuity, it's going to be 2000. If we're displaying or we're practicing aerobatics, it's going to be 7004, and that lets the controller know on the ground that we're going to be in a similar place and changing a lot of speeds and altitude over a short period of time. And if we're dropping parachutists, it's going to be 0033. Okay, and that makes the controller aware that in approximately five minutes' time, we'll be dropping people at the back of our aircraft so they can keep people away and make sure that that they're not going to come into uh, contact with an aircraft whilst dropping out of the sky. 
So if we're just establishing contact with uh, a controller, now they've got lots of radar contacts on their screen, so lots of